Hello, Nevada County. This is David Clark Carroll with the Nevada County Tech Connection. We are an initiative of the Economic Resource Council, and we like to look at how our county is using technology in many, many different modes. We've talked to folks from Center for the Arts, Nevada County Media, Office of Emergency Services. We looked at fiber broadband. Tonight, though, we're going to talk about one of my real pet pet topics and uh, something I've been trying to get together here for quite a little while. So I'm really glad it came together. We're joined tonight by Helen from Sierra Streams Institute, um, one of our local nonprofits that help monitor water quality, which when it is hot, brutal, and sunny, everyone loves to hop in a stream, lake, or a river. And so this is one of those topics that really touches just about everybody. So really pleased to have you here tonight. Um, I know you've told me your, your position and role with Sierra Streams, but I'd love to just hear, hear what you do for them from you and kind of how you got involved with them originally. Sure. Yeah, so I'm the Water Quality Lab Manager for your Sierra Streams Institute. I actually just started in February. Um, Prior to that, I've been using a lot of the things that Sierra Streams has put together over the years. They've got some incredible resources and I was using that in a similar position down in the San Francisco Bay area. So very excited to be joining Sierra Streams and to have been monitoring the last five months or so, I guess. We just finished up our intensive benthic macroinvertebrate monitoring season, um, which we can talk a little bit about later. We, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. We use um, state protocols so that we can compare our data to other groups. And then we measure a bunch of different things on a monthly and seasonal basis in the creeks around Damascus City. So what, what took you to this career path? Well, you know, my degree is actually in marine biology, but I ended up working in freshwater pretty much right out of college, but I always loved invertebrates. I worked with barnacles as an undergrad and um, yeah, just fell in love with that world. And uh, yeah, I worked in a lab for a few years at UC Santa Barbara doing freshwater ecology, looking at nanoparticle systems and how they impact the freshwater environment. I ended up missing people and missing being outdoors and kind of like that, that real life connection of science and people. And so I kind of tried to build a career that focused on that. So when I moved to the Bay, I, I didn't see anything quite like that and um, kind, of, kind of built it using some of CR Streams resources. It's been a lot more satisfying than living in a lab. Although I still get to go to the lab and live in it sometimes it is not all of the all of the job. So you, you were using Sierra Streams Institute um, programs before you, before you ever came here then? Yeah, I've been running into SSI at conferences for about six years, I think. Um, typically the Benthic Macroinvertebrate Conference in October every year. Um, and yeah, SSI put together this incredible bug book. It's a resource to help citizen scientists um, identify what they're finding in creeks. Um, it has tolerance values. So you can tell, you know, what kind of water quality the bug needs and what that might mean for your creek. Um, just some really amazing photos and keys to help you figure out what's going on in your creek. So that's actually how I learned my bugs and how I got into freshwater invertebrates. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been cool to know them over the years and especially cool to to have this opportunity to actually work with them. That's a cool um, path because invertebrates are one of those things that like I'm fascinated by them. I, I thoroughly enjoyed my invertebrate biology classes. Uh, I think my favorite animal was the, the whip scorpion that, that just glows. And it's just <laughs> like, it's one of those, just everything about it is, is strange and interesting and you're constantly wondering like, well, how did, what evolutionary pressure led to that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And 
danced around a little bit with talking about the bug book. Um, a lot of folks may be wondering, so why are we talking about invertebrates when it comes to water quality? And so th this is one of those things that, you know, just about anyone can get involved with looking in a, in a stream in their backyard. Can you talk a little bit about um, how identifying invertebrates living in these ecosystems help us kind of categorize the watersheds according to quality and contamination and, and so forth? Sure, yeah. So, um, well, I guess I should start at the beginning. So if you turn over rocks in the creek, you're likely to find little bugs. And these things are called benthic macroinvertebrates because they live on the bottom. Um, that you can see them with your naked eye, you don't need a microscope, and they lack a backbone, so they're invertebrates. Um, they're mostly juvenile forms of insects that you see flying around in uh, other times. Um, and they're awesome because they can really tell us kind of like a longer view of water quality. So, you know, a lot of the tech we'll be talking about, like you go to the creek and you put your meter in and you get your reading, but that's, you know, like 1 p.m. on a Tuesday and like who knows what happens the rest of the time. You know, even can, um, if we go out there every week, we're going to miss a lot. We might miss a stormwater event or a pollution event or like a heat wave. Um, and so, yeah, looking at the, the bug community can really tell us on a larger scale what's happening in the creek because different groups of bugs have a different tolerance level to pollution. And pollution could be heat stress. It could be, it doesn't just have to be, you know, uh, pesticides in the creek. So you can kind of get a, a long view rather than a simple snapshot. Um, yeah, and I guess they can't escape sudden changes in the creek the way a fish could. You know, you could look at other species composition to look at how healthy the creek is, but they really don't have the ability to leave. They're kind of stuck there. They're tiny, they don't swim well against a current. So they're gonna be exposed to whatever is happening in the creek. Um, yeah, and again, tolerance values vary among them. So you can say, if you find a lot of mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, they need really good water quality. And so it tends to be a pretty good sign for the creek. You can also learn about like diversity of habitat in your creek, because different bugs have different ways that they survive, things that they eat, things that they need to live. So you can learn a lot about the habitat as well. And they play an important food web link. You know, fish eat them and they're a really important base to the food web there. And if you're a fisherman, this is a good way of judging, is this creek going to be worth me, me throwing a line in and give you a sense of what, mm -hmm. what you might need to use as, as bait or a fly or, or so forth. Um, now, you're talking about how they can't move, so it's a good indicator of what that part of the creek health is. Is this the sort of thing where you see it generally can see a big difference between like, let's say an upstream cleaner area and then use them to isolate where a potential contaminant or pollutant comes into the creek? Absolutely, you can use it that way. And you can also learn about the different sections of the creek. You know, upstream you tend to have uh, bugs that can like shred whole leaves to get their food. Whereas downstream, the, you tend to have what's called collector gatherers. So they're just kind of filtering the bits of things out of the water that, that come down from upstream from all that shredding. Um, but yeah, if you can look at benthic macrovertebrates over the watershed, you can definitely pinpoint. I mean, you don't always know what it would be. That's where a more complex meter would come in and you can start investigating, you know, is it, you know, conductivity coming from road salt or something like that. Um, but it can kind of be like a, uh, an indicator. So let's say you're working your way down that down a waterway and you're finding really, you know, lots of those caddis flies and the water's high quality. And then you hit a stretch where it's not as much. What, what tool, uh, we'll get into the tech here a little bit. What tool do you use to look at that water and try and figure out what might be going on there? Well, so there's, there's kind of five vital signs that you can kind of start with. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they're some of the ones that we measure every month at sites around the area. Um, 
so they're kind of like yeah vital signs for the for the water so temperature is one conductivity or like how many ions or salts are present in the water um, ph is an important one too uh, turbidity so uh, suspended solids in the water and i'm forgetting the last one well yeah dissolved oxygen is also really important and it kind of is impacted by a lot of the other parameters. Um, so those are kind of the big five that you can start with. Um, we also like to look at nutrients, um, especially in more uh, populated areas. You tend to have higher levels of nutrients than uh, the creek would normally support, either from fertilizer or from other sources, but you can have algal blooms that result from that. Um, so nitrates and phosphates are a good thing to look at. Um, we also like to look at bacteria um, as an indicator for, well, human health, but also just like uh, impacts to the creek. Very cool. Now, you had some, uh, some nice slides to show us what some of these tools look like. Do you want to yeah. bring those up and give us an idea of what, what this looks like? Yeah, let's see what we can do here. Ooh. Looks like we've got your yeah, speaker notes there. If you want, if you want, I can pull up the uh, slides. Oh, there we go. Looks mm -hmm. good. All right. Yeah. So the some of the meters that we use it tends to be the more expensive ones are the ones you can actually like walk up to the creek and stick it in and get a reading. There's a lot that happens like behind the scenes, building it, you have to purchase it, it's rather expensive, you need to calibrate it. But when it comes down to it in the moment, you just put it in and take a reading right from the creek. So this is a meter, um, it's made by YSI and it measures dissolved oxygen. So just how much oxygen is dissolved in the water and it uses a polar graphic sensor. So it uses the oxygen in the water and a cathode to create an electrical current. And actually using voltage is kind of a common theme among the meters that you use where you just stick them in the creek. It's a really common way to convert uh, what you're trying to look at into what a meter can read. Um, so in this case, by measuring how strong the current is, you can discover how concentrated the oxygen in the water is. So on the upper right there is the membrane covering the polar graphic sensor. It's got a little yellow cap around it because it's expensive and delicate. Um, and that helps keep us from uh, hitting it on things or messing with it. Um, yeah, so the way it works is that oxygen actually diffuses through the membrane and is reduced to the cathode that's inside the sensor. And the cathode is held at a defined potential. And so the measured reduction in current is proportional to the partial pressure of oxygen in the media. So the more oxygen that passes the membrane and is reduced, the greater the electrical current read by the sensor. So the kind of the other common theme among these meters and among these, really among the parameters that we're talking about is temperature. Temperature is really important for all of these. And so um, in this case, warmer water, the molecules move faster and it, they just can't hold dissolved gas as well. So warmer water can't hold as much oxygen. And so it's important for, you know, just to know for, for water quality and for life living in the water. It's a little harder to live in warmer water. In the case of the meter, we just need to know that so that we can compensate our reading to temperature. So there's an automatic temperature calibration that happens in most meters to kind of calibrate to 25 degrees C so that we can kind of compare all our readings in a better way. That is a pretty awesome piece of tech using 
a whole <laughs> bunch of different scientific disciplines there, all, all kind of crammed into one. That's pretty cool. Now, that looks like that's something you could literally just pretty much have in your pocket, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Once you get it calibrated, it's, it's a turn on, you press power, you stick it in the creek. You do have to wait a little while for it to kind of equilibrate. Um, it'll trend downward. If you, because of the way that it measures oxygen, you know, it's actually, it's going across a membrane, it's being changed. If I were to put this in a stagnant pond without any water moving, it would use up the oxygen around it and the values would just drop and they would just keep dropping until it used up all the oxygen. So generally we like to record our measurements in moving water. If we can't, then you know we find something that isn't moving. But in this case, we actually need to swing the meter back and forth to artificially create movement. But it really is a kind of a plug and chug meter. So other than that, you gotta swing it around a little bit if you're in a lake. It's, I mean, that's that's just <laughs> mind blowing as far as making it accessible. You know. Um, yeah, see, it really does. Uh, it makes it so that um, you know we we work with volunteers primarily. You know, these are volunteers who may not know all the tech behind the meter, but it's easy enough to use. Um, that with a little bit of experience, they can get some really good data. Well, let's break back from this, uh, this screen here and talk a little bit about volunteers because that's, that's a huge part of what you guys do. Yeah. Um, how are you involved in recruiting at all or are you mainly directing in the field? Um, I think in the past, the position has been kind of both. Right now, we actually have um, an awesome person who's helping with outreach, Allie. And so she's kind of helping us recover from, you know, a year and change without seeing our volunteers um, and kind of, you know, everyone's life changed the last year. And so we're a little low and could use some help and she's helping get the word out and find people. You hear that in Nevada County? <laughs> Volunteer with Sierra Streams, help, help keep our water happy and healthy. Now, I think one of the things that's so cool about this is now you talked about wanting to get out of the lab and tech like this makes it so you don't have to, let's say, jar up 50 water samples take them all back mm -hmm. and process them one by one, one by one in some giant machine in a lab, which uh, when I was an undergrad, that's how you did water sampling. Uh, you just, mm -hmm. you know, I remember when I was a freshman doing some sampling in the Charles River in Boston and they literally had milk crate after milk crate after milk crate of sample bottles. And we're just all filling them up and like, you know, they hand you a GPS, they hand you a milk crate, and they say, write down the coordinates on the bottle. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it definitely creates a bottleneck back at the lab too. Some poor undergrad or grad student or lab manager, or all three are going to have to, to sort their way through those over the next however long. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, lab because you guys still do testing in labs. I, I know you were mm -hmm. able to connect with uh, Sierra College, right, to get a uh, yes. lab space. Yes, that has been incredibly helpful. I've spent this week there also. Um, this is our monitoring week, so we're in the field in the mornings and then at Sierra College in the afternoons running some of our samples, the ones that we do put in bottles and take to the lab. But yeah, they've been an incredible help. We were without an office or lab or any stuff really. Um, so we've been in the process of replacing that. And um, yeah, they helped us out by giving us a classroom as a temporary lab space, just a place we could put our stuff, put our samples and, and get the job done. So 
when you're bringing stuff back to look at in the lab setting, what are you looking and testing for that um, the field tools aren't, aren't capable of, of doing? Yeah, um, maybe I could share my screen again and show you some of those meters. Yeah, yeah pop it up. Okay, let me... Okay, so the things that we can't really do in the field or can do better in the lab, I should say, um, are looking at um, some of those nutrients, nitrates and phosphates. Um, we don't really have meters that can do that in the field, but if we take our samples and put them on ice, we take them back to the lab, we use this Hawk colorimeter to, we basically add reagents to our samples and that creates a color. So we use a spectrophotometer. In this case, this is the Hawk meter. So it'll pass light through the sample and then measure the light intensity at different wavelengths, depending on the color that's produced in the reaction. So, you know, for nitrates, we add one reagent pack, we do some, a certain thing, we mix it, we let it sit for a bit, and then we read it in the machine. And if it's turned to color, the intensity of the color will tell us um, the level of nitrates in that sample. And the same for phosphate. That's a pretty cool piece of gear. I, I think pretty much most folks out there at some point have, you know, used a little pH test strip where you're holding it up to, you know, the box with the various colors on it, trying to figure out what it most matches. And this yeah. just takes all of that out of the equation. <laughs> it takes the human error out for sure, or at least a good chunk of it. Yeah. If you put the wrong reagent in or have the wrong vial, that's on you. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's no guessing about the color. Yes. Um, now we talked to, a little bit about um, nitrogen and phosphorus, those are mainly coming from um, human contamination sources. I think everyone first thought is, is lawns um, and the landscaping. What, what other sources do, do you see those coming from? So, and I mean, um, I should say nitrates and phosphates are necessary for, for the growth of living things, like they're necessary things in the creek. Um, and as such, they're used in fertilizers because we like to make things grow really fast. So a lot of times it can be fertilizers coming in. It also could be sources just like human waste, you know, um, septic systems leaking or things like that. Um, yeah, and when, when the nutrients are out of whack in a system, you can kind of, things can get out of control pretty fast with algae. I think the the idea of septic contamination is kind of everyone's gut uh, um, <laughs> is looking at nutrients a better way to gauge that that's happening versus looking at bacteria or or is looking for the bacteria a better a better tip off. Well, you queued up my next slide well because nutrients can be an indication, but really we should be looking at bacteria and that's the other thing that we do in the lab is um, we grow bacteria in a safe way and figure out whether it's harmful or not and where it might be coming from. So this is actually, I don't know, I think this is one of the, one of the cooler things that, that we can do. Um, usually this would be, you know, you'd, you'd need a, a really fancy lab, you'd need a lot of protective gear, you'd need a lot of tubes to do your serial dilutions. And this IDEX call alert method has made it very simple, easy and reliable to do without all of that, you know? And you end up with a sealed tray that can't contaminate anything. And all you need to do is give it to someone to autoclave, to get it to really high temperature and pressure. So what we look at for bacteria are fecal coliforms, which are kind of a 
broad scale bacteria that are found in fecal matter from a wide variety of organisms. It doesn't have to be humans. And they are not themselves harmful, but they tend to be an indicator that harmful organisms like E. coli may be present. And so E. coli is the second thing we test for. Um, and that originates only in the intestines of animals and humans. So their presence indicates a stronger likelihood that human or animal wastes are entering the system and E. coli can be harmful to humans. So the EPA has um, limits at which, you know, swimming holes, things like that are not supposed to go over for E. coli. Um, so in this case, we actually, we take the sample in a hundred mil bottle we go back to the lab, we put it on ice first because we don't want any of this to grow any more than it was in the creek. We just want to take that sample and preserve it as is. Um, we add a nutrient media that the bacteria can grow in. And the media contains indicators that are only digested by certain bacteria. So in the case of the fecal coliforms, they will digest a certain indicator to produce a yellow color. Um, and in the case of E. coli, they'll digest another indicator to produce fluorescence. And so once we have the media, we shake it up, we pour it into this tray that separates it into wells. It's like a serial dilution process without ever having to waste a bunch of glass tubes and pipettes. Um, and then we seal it, that's an important part because we were growing ten potentially harmful bacteria. And then we put it in an incubator for about 24 hours. And then we look at it for um, presence of a yellow color, which would indicate fecal coliforms. And also we shine a black light on it and see if it glows and that would indicate E. coli. So E. coli are like a subset of fecal coliforms. There's many other things that could be growing in there producing that yellow color, but only E. coli would fluoresce. Very cool. Now, I'm gonna break away from the slides just to yeah. give people's eyes a break here. <laughs> um, we talked about a little bit about earlier other elements like turbidity, pH. Um, turbidity, I think is one of those words that people may have heard. Let's talk a little bit more about what that means and how it affects the waterways. Yeah, so turbidity is, you know, rather than things being dissolved in the water, it's like suspended solids in the water. So it's like a visual guide to water quality. Um, it'll appear to be cloudy or kind of muddy. If you look at a creek after a storm, it can look like hot chocolate, like pretty opaque, pretty dark. Um, what you're seeing is turbidity, things that are solid suspended in the water. And the temperature correlation is interesting here too, because you know the specific heat of water is very high. It takes a lot of energy to heat water, which is good for the things living in the water um, generally. Once you have a lot of solids in the water, they heat faster than water. So energy from the sun heats those solids pretty fast and that heats the water and you can end up with lower dissolved oxygen a lot faster given the same set of circumstances in terms of energy input in terms of heat if you have a turbid creek versus a clear creek. And I think that's one of those visual things that it, it, it really catches your attention. Like everyone, when the Yuba runs yellow, everyone's talking about it. Um, <laughs> you know, when like a swimming hole that you find some E. coli in like every year at Lake Wildwood, people, you know, it, it's not quite as a visceral response. It's, ew, I'm not gonna go swimming there today. It's not like, oh my God, what's happened to our, our river? Right, and yeah. It, you know, it, I didn't. I didn't realize that it affects the 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 heat retention either. That's uh. That, that's one of those. Everything builds on everything, you know. Yeah, it really does, and it really is a visual indicator. Like you're not going to see the nitrates, the phosphates, the bacteria, the conductivity. It's all. It can look great and have some problems, but turbidity really. People will notice for sure. 
Now, what's in in Nevada County water ways? What are what are the more common um, things that are suspended in that water, making or you know a, a turbid environment there? Well, honestly, I think the big one is just soil. Like when it rains, yeah, you know water runs off whatever surfaces are around. Um, even urban environments that don't have a lot of soil, they get a lot of buildup of other things. Um, this could be, you know, waste from dogs or uh, oil or grease in your gutter. Um, all these things kind of build up and then when it rains, water runs downhill, water reaches the creek and it brings with it everything that it came into contact with is great for the streets not so much for the creeks at that time um so i'd say you know there's a certain amount of urban pollutants there's a certain amount of fertilizers that can come off of farms and other land um and then there's some amount that's just soil um a lot of erosion can happen in, in rainstorms too I think you had a, an image of the turbidity meter yes. somewhere here. Um, yeah, I can go ahead and share that. Do you want to pull it up? Let's see. I think I've got it right here. Yes. Yeah, so this is kind of, it's kind of cool. It's like a hybrid. We actually do this in the field but it's using similar technology um, as we use uh, in the lab. You've got like a nested window situation. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I've got um, it, you want me to do yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, pull that up there. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is like, this is a colorimeter similar to what we use in the lab for um, nitrates and phosphates. In this case, we're measuring light scatter from the sample itself. We don't have to add anything. We just collect our sample in the little vial there. We put it into the top of the machine. We close the lid and then a light beam uh, hits the vial. A light detector at 90 degrees records scatter. So if the sample was really clear, we wouldn't be getting much scatter. It would be a low reading. If the sample has a lot of stuff in it, we get a lot more light scattered, we get a higher reading. So it's a pretty portable and straightforward way to look at turbidity. And the one, the one thing that comes to my mind when looking at that type of device, turbidity is it feel like particularly when you've got flowing water, flowing water can carry stuff that would fall out of the water column if it's not moving. Is it a challenge to accurately measure the turbidity in a small vial that's stationary? Like how, how do you have to like shake it up before you put it in? Mm, right, so we do always want to measure from flowing water where possible. If we do see, you know, <laughs> creeks around here are just coming from a very urban area in the Bay. Creeks around here are really nice. Um, like even just the standards that I need to use to calibrate the meters are so much lower, like a much lower conductivity is needed, a much lower turbidity is needed to get the meter ready to be in these creeks than in the bay. Um, so turbidity here is actually, is pretty low. I mean, if unless you're going out after a storm, you don't see that much stuff in there. If it is um, turbid enough that you're really seeing things settle out, you do need to mix them uh, before you read. And we also take three vials and three readings per vial to try to get a better like average value than just one. Cool, cool. It sounds like turbidity up here at least is, you know, while it may catch your attention, isn't really as, as long 
long term an issue as something that we haven't talked about yet, which is pH, right? That's one of those. Um, it, it, anyone who's had old pipes knows how important pH is. And uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's plunge into that, that that topic now. Yeah, yeah. And so pH is kind of an interesting one too. Um, the meter is pretty interesting, and yeah, it can be an issue, as you said, for drinking water, for pipes. Obviously, Flint, Michigan was an example of that. Um, it can also be an issue like in the spring, summer, as algae starts to grow in the creek, that impacts the pH. And yeah, it can be, it can definitely be an issue. Do you wanna take a look at the meter? That would be cool, yeah. Yeah, I'll let you pull that up. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> so pH is just the concentration of hydrogen ions and this meter is actually it's very small you can see someone's hand in there it's it's pretty compact compared to the YSI the bigger meter that you have like the handheld part and a long cable and then like the part in the creek you can actually just um this is actually a picture of Alex using a conductivity meter in the creek. It's small, you just stick it in, get your readings. Um, so like the other meters where you use them in the creek, you're looking, the meter uses a change in charge to figure out the pH. Um, in this case, hydrogen ions um, have, you know, the potential to produce an electrical current so it's a bit like a battery. Um, and these electrodes are actually a little bit different. Each one is kind of like a mini chemical set in its own right. So the one on the bottom there is the glass electrode. Um, it's got a wire in there and it's suspended in a solution of potassium chloride. And it's inside a bulb that's typically made from a special glass containing metal salts. The other uh, electrode is the reference electrode. You need two to create that current. Um, so the, the solution inside the glass electrode is neutral. It has a pH of seven. And what the glass electrode does is to measure the difference in pH between the inside, the voltage on the inside and whatever you put it in on the outside. Um, and since we know the pH of the internal solution, we can figure out the pH of the external solution. That's a nifty little piece of tech there. <laughs> yeah, and it's actually one of, I mean, the, the YSI meters for uh, dissolved oxygen and conductivity uh, cost in the thousands of dollars and this costs in the hundreds of dollars, so. Very cool. Um, now that we've looked at how to measure it, uh, you mentioned algae can, can affect the pH, a lot of things. How does the changing pH affect the uh, wildlife in, in the stream? You know, like if it goes up or down, what, what gets affected? Well, I mean, in terms of the bug community, a lot of these things are a lot of the invertebrates and things like that are adapted to certain ranges. There's like a normal range of pH, um, usually thought of as like six to nine, six and a half to eight and a half. Um, going outside that can, you know, making a solution very acidic or very basic can really alter um, the chemistry of the water and alter the way that the organisms interact with the water, making it yeah. either unlivable or uncomfortable. Most of the benthic macroinvertebrates that we were talking about earlier are primarily arthropods, um, but I do know that there are some crustaceans that live in these waterways. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how the pH uh, affects those guys specifically? Yeah, so I mean, in any sort of shell forming environment, um, pH is going to have 
an impact on that. You're not gonna be able to form your protection as well. If you have a very acidic environment, you're just not gonna be able to build up the minerals you need. They'll be kind of eaten away. So what comes to mind specifically like the, the crayfish, is that fair to say that, that that would affect them more than the caddis flies? I believe so, yeah, I think absolutely. And it's it's funny because typically we don't use like crayfish or snails or some of those uh, non-insect taxa mm -hmm. as much as water quality indicators, um, but they are definitely impacted by pH and they are important parts of the um, ecosystem in creeks. Yeah, it's, it's not just the, I think people, I too tend to get focused on like the, the good water quality trifecta bugs, but it's really, um, it's the whole assemblage. It's everything from snails and worms to caddisflies and stoneflies that make up a vibrant creek ecosystem. Well, I think that brings us, I know you have a couple slides uh, talking a little bit more about these benthic macroinvertebrates, which uh, for all the viewers out there, let's just break that that word down for a minute briefly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a, a mouthful. We tend to abbreviate it as BMI. So benthic just means the bottom of a water body. And, you know, they live down there because they can't really swim around above, above the bottom. They aren't big enough to swim against the current. So they tend to be under rocks, in nooks and crannies, sometimes in the mud. Um, so benthic just means they're on the bottom, they're bottom dwelling. Macro means you can see them with your naked eye. You don't need a microscope or a hand lens. Um, yeah, they tend to be a millimeter. The net we use to collect them is um, 0.5 millimeter. So we, we don't wanna get the crazy tiny stuff, but we wanna get the stuff you can see. And then they're invertebrates, they don't have a backbone. Uh, is, is part of choosing that particular size of invertebrate to look at um, utility, an indicator of quality? Because I think, I think at this point, a lot of folks have heard about water bears and tardigrades because they're, they're adorable and cute, but at the same time, <laughs> like they can survive in space. So <laughs> they're not a good indicator of how clean the water is. Yeah, uh, I think I think it's probably both. Um, they're, they're a lot harder to find. Um, and I don't know that they have as close a tie to, um, you know, that they're as to tolerance level and to water quality as these benthic macroinvertebrates. Cool, cool. I just <laughs> I pretty much just wanted to say uh, the word water bear and tardigrade. <laughs> awesome. Uh, <laughs> It's also one of those fun introductory science things that just about anyone can do because they live everywhere. And yeah. yeah, water bears are fun to look at under a microscope if you haven't. And They're amazing. I think, <laughs> yeah, they were one of my first invertebrate loves also. <laughs> uh, let's see, you wanna pull up those slides of the BMI sampling? Yeah, so this is actually, um, one of the lowest tech things we do. Um, you really just get out there with a good net uh, and you dig your fingers through the bottom of the creek, you brush off rocks. You, you should really, ideally you're doing it in moving water so you can let the water pick up the things that can't swim well and push them into the net for you. Um, yeah, and then we, process, we do our own bug uh, identification. We have volunteers who are super skilled and trained in this. Um, so we wanna like go through the sample and make sure it's not full of leaves and algae and rocks and things and make it as easy on them as possible. Um, yeah, and then we preserve the sample in a high concentration of ethanol. It's the saddest part and then they're preserved for 
years to come. Hopefully it doesn't take that long to identify them, but um, yeah, we have some really skilled volunteers who are also really happy to train others who are interested. So um, like myself, you can, you can learn bugs from the bug book and, and take a look at life under the water. Now, you say preserve them. Does this mean you have a whole uh, kind of back um, back library of of these organisms? Uh, we did before the fire. Ah, uh, of, that's of, all all gone now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, um, it looked like but, you had a cool video uh, on your slides there. Um, oh yeah. I think I can go ahead and play the, play this and screen share it if you want to that introduce great, what, we'll, yeah. what we'll be watching. Yeah, Let's so this more. is a video of a, a nymph form of a aquatic insect. Um, you know, they molt many times underwater as they get bigger and then they finally molt into adults. So they actually crawl out of the creek. They find somewhere to hold on and they do their last molt and out comes a, uh, a winged adult. And the cool thing about this, if you um, go ahead and play it, you'll actually see like wing pads are forming even on the aquatic species, the aquatic form. Um, they're, they're growing their adult appendages while they're underwater, while they're not in use. And then yeah, when well, they come out, this out already. So you can see the wing pads on the back there have actually started to separate. And it's kind of between the shoulder blades, the adult comes out. You'll see there are some similarities there. I mean, it doesn't look that different. So that's less of a radical metamorphosis than let's say we see with butterflies and moths, correct? Yes, so this is incomplete metamorphosis. It kind of merges together the larva and pupa stage. So they're going straight from a juvenile form without the pupa and the adult is coming out of that. There are certain um, aquatic insects underwater, like true flies, that do go through the full um, larva pupa adult metamorphosis. And they do not look as similar. Um, their juvenile and adult forms, you could not tell probably. They would be the same. <laughs> so when you see something small and brown in the river, it eventually turns into this just iridescent <laughs> it's pretty amazing yeah that that was growing in there <laughs> oh, this is so cool <laughs> It's interesting, some of the life, some of the adult forms, especially for mayflies, only live a couple of days. Like really the vast majority of their life is underwater. The adults don't even have feeding mouth parts. They just reproduce and that's it. So there's a wide, wide variety of, of uh, ways to make it work. It's just fascinating that something then the adult stage only lives for a couple of days. You guys are relying on in the larval stage to be around for how, how long does the larval stage uh, live for in, in, in the water? It kind of depends, but months, definitely. We do two survey. Uh, we survey all of our sites twice a year, once in June and once in October, because we have different uh, communities at those different times. Um, but yeah, mayflies, they're their lar larval or nymph stages last for months underwater. And that's really the, the primary part of their life. Oh, this, this has just been so much fun. <laughs> um, 
uh, let's see. I think we covered a lot of uh, what I wanted to get to. Um, now, you're, you're more in the testing and field work side, but I wanted to just mention here at the end, uh, we've been dancing around, I might have mentioned at the start, but Sierra Streams, you, you lost your whole building with years of research in the Jones fire last year. And yes. so um, anyone out there that likes what they're doing, check them out, support them, volunteer. Uh, they're clearly up and running doing what they do. And uh, I think that's just awesome and impressive and uh, just a valuable resource to our community. And I had no idea that their bug book was so widespread that you were uh, using it in, in a previous job. Uh, yeah, it's an amazing book. Um, we, I think we lost our back copies of that as well, but we'll be restocking. Um, yeah, and we, I mean, volunteers are the heart of the organization. It's, it's working with the community and, um, you know, what they bring to us, what we can bring to them that's really like kept us going these last 20 something years. Um, yeah, it's, we have, we have folks working, you know, students working on GIS projects. Uh, so many people have such diverse skills that we can partner with them on, so. Is, can volunteers pretty much um, get involved at their leisure and submit data or is it more organized days of, of folks going out and doing stuff? It's fairly organized. We keep it to one week a month. Um, and, you know, everyone goes out in the same week. It's got to be a morning before noon. Um, we do a little bit of training to make sure that all of the data we, that all the different people collect can be compared. Uh, we tend to send folks out with a, a seasoned veteran monitor or someone like myself or Alex or AmeriCorps. Um, so, yeah, it's a little more structured. Um, but things like observational monitoring, you know, you don't need training to do that. You don't need training to notice that the creek is yellow or whatever. Um, there's lots of ways you can contribute to the data that we collect. And I should say that, you know, the, the monitoring program is, is one thing we do. We also do restoration, like um, a lot of the monitoring can feed into restoration. So we do native habitat um, work and restoration in different places. So, which is, you know, a whole other skill set and interest level for potential volunteers as well. And presumably everyone uh, that helps out can, you know, if you'd rather be doing restoration, it's possible to s sign up for that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Or, you know, in <laughs> this last month, if you want to scrape glue off floors, you can do that too. We've all been taking turns making the new office uh, habitable and something that's going to work for our lab and our, and our office for the next some number of years. So it's, so it's with a, with a small nonprofit, there's a, always a diverse amount of things you can do. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you guys are settling into uh, your new office. Are you going to be um, still using Sierra College's lab space for a little while still, or what's... Uh... Just through the end of the month. They're opening back up for classes in August. So we are out at the end of the month and luckily we'll be in at our new office in August. So just in time. <laughs> well, that's, that's fantastic news. Yes. Well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time here and we're approaching the end of the hour. Um, do you have any, any closing thoughts for uh, folks out there? Um, I don't know. I think, I think it can be really connecting and enlightening to get out in your watershed and, and really look at the creek, you know, maybe turn over a rock or Put your hand in the water. Is it cold? Is it warm? Um, I think it can be a really enjoyable and connecting experience to, to get to know your environment a little more. And I'm very excited to be here and, uh, and helping people connect in that way and, and learning from them while I do it. Thanks so much, Helen. I'm going to stick a whole bunch of links down below. So click on to check out what Sierra Streams is doing how you can get involved, how you can support them and uh, help keep, uh, you know, 
water as clean as we can make it and uh, continue to do so. Uh, so thanks so much for everyone out there. I'm David Clark Carroll with the Nevada County Tech Connection. I've been joined with Helen from Sierra Streams Institute. And uh, I had an awful lot of fun tonight. I hope you did too. Thank thanks you so, so much, much, David.